All right, hi everyone. My name is Candace Teal and I'm an AmeriCorps member serving Conservation Nebraska's Common Ground Program. Thank you so much for being here and attending our Swiss Army Landscaping Webinar, where we hope to learn more about multi-use plants and how to plant a yard with functionality. A couple of reminders before we get started. You all are muted and your cameras are off so you can't be seen or heard. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to type them in the chat box and we will go over them at the end. This webinar is being recorded, so if you miss anything, it will be posted on our Conservation Nebraska YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. Lastly, there will be a short poll that will pop up on your screen with just a couple of questions. These help Conservation Nebraska to improve on future webinars and events. If you've ever been sitting at home wondering how to help with conservation, this is a great way to help with minimal effort. And then here with us today is Graham Herbst. Graham is a native Nebraskan, graduate of the horticultural program at UNL and holds a master's in urban studies from UNO. After working in the landscape and arboriculture industries, he moved to the Nebraska Forest Service to promote innovative urban forestry projects as the community forestry specialist for Eastern Nebraska. Graham loves growing trees and gardening, connecting people and information through social media and exploring each corner of the state. He wants to hear from tree advocates about forestry challenges and opportunities in Nebraska communities. And now I will hand it over to the man of the hour, Graham Herbst, to teach us about Swiss Army landscaping. Thanks, Candace. I know that was a lot of jargon in there. Basically, I'm just an urban and community forester. I serve the eastern half of the state and uh, glad to uh, connect any of you with information or resources as I'm able to. So I'll have some contact information at the end of the presentation that you can jot down or refer back to in the recording that Candace mentioned. Um, I, I wanna start off just with the title, Swiss Army Landscaping, what do I mean by that? Um, I, I, I find that uh, it's, it's often difficult for us to look past aesthetic issues with our, our landscapes and think of them as more uh, useful than uh, simply being attractive. And, and so I wanted to put together a presentation that highlighted some of the really interesting plants and uses for the landscape that other people find inspiration from so that I could share that and, and maybe uh, light a fire in those that, that otherwise are uh, not thinking as much about how they could find some use in their landscape. So um, we, we all have really busy lives, right? We're, we're, we're short on time. Um, we're spending money on lots of different things. Um, as I finished my undergraduate uh, degree and went into the landscaping field running installation uh, crews and uh, doing a little bit of landscape design, um, it, it, was, it was challenging working with clients that really just saw their landscape as wallpaper for the outdoors. They wanted it to be attractive as they're looking out the window, doing the dishes. They want it to be something that uh, looks nice when they're entertaining company, um, but they often uh, didn't want to do much themselves. What I really found the most, got the most energy from was a, a client that maybe didn't know as much as they wanted to about their landscape, but they really kind of wanted the dominoes set up so that they could take it from there and really get involved on their own rather than just uh, seeing landscaping as something that you pay somebody to do every year. There was also the aesthetic challenge of lots of people having the sort of Disneyland approach to the aesthetic that they were looking for when there were lots of other uh, more sustainable and in some ways more interesting approaches to landscape design, even from an aesthetic standpoint alone. I worked in a lot of really beautiful landscapes that were different degrees of, of input from um, annual beds that were planted three, four times a year with different plants to create lots of color throughout the year that were um, very expensive and came with large contracts. Um, some of them you know, had different aesthetics, different approaches to design, all uh, beautiful in their own right but most of these were landscapes that had very little involvement from the homeowner themselves. So uh, what, what I found myself saying more and more as I was in these landscapes is, you know, where's the food? Where is the functionality? Where is the fun and the innovation that a, a yard can really bring to somebody uh, that owns the property 
and not just seeing a bunch of green grass with a border of other stuff that needs to be taken care of by somebody that knows more than they do about landscape. So I came up with this idea of the Swiss Army knife, right? So we're all familiar with what these look like. This is an image I pulled offline of a earlier iteration of, of the, Swiss Army land, uh, the Swiss Army knife. Lots of different things in there. There was even in the handle, a small set of lock picks and uh, apparently a functioning small revolver. I read it on the internet, so it must be true, right? Um, so the idea here is we need to see our yards as having multiple functions because as we know from a, any sort of education about ecosystems, everything's connected, right? An ecosystem is a, a spider web that we can't tug, out, tug at without some other portion of that web being impacted. And so we need to not be as myopic as we tend to be with our landscapes and the way we look at them. So what I'm gonna do in this next hour is highlight a handful of plants and different uh, concepts that might bring you some ideas on how you could engage more with your landscape. So for starters, we'll talk a little bit about underutilized plants for windbreaks. Now in the city, we don't think of, of our plant, our landscapes as, as serving a windbreak function per se. And in some cases, they don't do a whole lot of that. Uh, but windbreaks also provide a visual screen. One of the fundamental concepts of landscape design is creating interest and mystery. And part of the way we do that is by creating outdoor rooms that, uh, that uh, discourage somebody from being able to pick any one location in the yard and look out and see everything that's going on. When you can divide your yard up into smaller spaces that have um, plants that block your view in some ways, then that encourages people to explore your yard a bit more and not just sit in a chair and be able to see everything that the yard has to offer. So I did a landscape design uh, for the, the 4-H Center um, out by uh, Springfield. Uh, this is a little south of Gretna and put together some plants that uh, are not necessarily traditional windbreak plants, but those that should be considered at least being used in some smaller numbers. So we'll talk about a handful of those. Bosnian pine, mugo pine, and domingo pine. One thing I'll say about Bosnian pine, as the name implies, this is a European species of pine. So it will have some degree of susceptibility to pine wilt disease, which is native to North America and can be pretty problematic for a species of pine that we bring from other continents. So there's a cautionary note there in terms of not planting an entire windbreak with dozens and dozens of Bosnian pine, because it remains to be seen how susceptible pine, uh, this plant is uh, to pine wilt in this case. Mugo pine is one that some of you may be familiar with as a, as a really small, cute little evergreen shrub that's sold. There is a tree form of that as well that should be considered for windbreaks. And then Domingo pine is a hybrid between Eastern white pine, which is native to North America, and Mexican white pine, which as the name implies is indigenous to the south of us. And that cross is hopefully going to provide some increased drought resistance that Eastern white pine is susceptible to a little bit. So those are three to consider. Mugo pine, uh, there's a couple others. Uh, Mugo pine is one as the, I have a picture on the bottom here of pine nuts. There are a handful of species of pine like bristle cone that are available in the trade and do provide an edible nut that we're probably all familiar with being used in pesto and culinary uh, recipes like that. There are also non -con coniferous trees that we should consider for windbreaks and they have an attribute that is called marcescence. And this is basically a tree species tendency to hold on to dried leaves through the winter time. They're not necessarily functioning as a windbreak as effectively as a conifer does, a, as an evergreen, but they do provide a visual screen with their persistent leaves through the fall into some portion of the winter time. And they do uh, slow down wind to some degree in those colder months as well. 
sawtooth and shingle oaks are two oaks that are on the faster growing side with amongst the oaks. Oaks get kind of a, uh, a reputation for being slower growing, which isn't entirely untrue, but usually exaggerated. But if you want an oak that's gonna provide some uh, food for deer, squirrels, turkey, and other uh, small animals, uh, shingle and sawtooth oak are, are faster growing ones that will provide those acorns and have that marcescence that I mentioned. Another marcescent tree that's native here in the area is American hornbeam or hop hornbeam it's called sometimes. Uh, this is a natural understory plant in our native forests that has a smaller size. It's not going to be a, a huge shade tree so it's going to work better in smaller confined residential spaces. And it does have some pretty attractive hop-like fruit on it that you can see in that middle picture. A couple other shrubs. There are some viburnums that are at least semi-evergreen, meaning they really want to hold on to those leaves year after year and not shed them all every season. Uh, depending on how exposed the location that you're planting them in is in the winter time, they may or may not successfully hold those leaves all winter uh, but they do a good job of being that visual screen and uh, just a plant that viburnums are one of those genus of plants that we would do well to incorporate into our landscapes more. American plum, these are just getting ready to bloom right now. They're going to look like this picture in the bottom right here in another week or two. This is a plant that um, is certainly at home here in Nebraska. It's native to the state and the area. It is tenacious and easy to grow. It does form a clonal thicket, so it's going to spread underground and pop back up and, and uh, be, fill a larger space that way. And they do, as the name implies, have an edible fruit that is just delicious in the years that we get good fruit set from it. One thing I will mention is that viburnums are very tasty to deer. So if you're in an acreage situation where deer are uh, normal visitors of your landscape, viburnum may not be one that you want to plant a lot of knowing that that browse damage that can come with the deer is a possibility. So now I'm going to move into some more herbaceous plants that are annuals in most cases, things that you'll need to plant year after year, but there will be some perennials in here as well. This first one was introduced to me by a plant nerd friend of mine uh, this is called Huacatai. It is in the uh, marigold family. Tegetes minuta is a different species of what we would call marigolds here in America. It has uh, fairly attractive flowers to it. They're small, not real conspicuous. They can be fairly abundant uh, for pollinators to take advantage of. What I will say is that whenever we're introducing annuals that, that are prolific uh, bloomers and cedars in particular, we're always watching for that to become a problem in the landscape. My experience with Wakatai has been that it tends to bloom so late, often in October, that it's not really setting seed before it gets really cold here in Nebraska. And so that makes it fairly easy to prevent from becoming a problem in your landscape and popping up year after year when maybe you're done uh, using that plant. In Central and South America, it is really important for a uh, dish called ocopa. It's mixed with breadcrumbs and milk. Uh, the, they take the foliage and dry it and, and mix it into almost kind of like a herby Alfredo sauce. And then it's served on top of boiled potatoes, often with um, hard boiled egg, as you see in the picture here, maybe a little bit of lettuce as well. And when you, one of the things that I love about this plant is it's very uh, sensory. You, I can't, when I have this plant in my yard, I can't walk past it without brushing my hands across it and getting that smell that is ultimately incorporated into the sauce of a copa. Lead plant is a perennial that's native to the Great Plains here in, in, uh, in uh, the Midwest, Amorpha canicens. It is referred to by indigenous people as buffalo bellows plant. 
it was their tradition to typically harvest this plant for use while the uh, bison were in rut, which is where it gets its uh, indigenous name from. But a beautiful flower is kind of akin to a, a Veronica, which you may be more familiar with from the nursery trade. This is a plant that is, has a lot of essential oils in the, in the foliage, sort of like Wakatai does. And it makes a really nice herbal tea if you enjoy herbal teas. Not a lot to, to mention about how that's done. We're all familiar, you dry the foliage, you boil it in water, um, take the, the, uh, the, the leaves from the tea back out and you have a, a really nice fragrant and uh, tasty herbal tea that you can use from a plant right in your landscape. Lemon verbena is another one in the same sort of uh, realm of plants that are good for food and drink. Lemon verbena is not native anywhere around here. It's a tropical that you'll find in your nursery to be uh, purchased as an annual. It has fairly attractive flowers. And as the name implies, of course, a very strong lemon fragrance to the foliage. It can be incorporated into homemade ice creams to flavor those really well. It's used in a number of toiletries and uh, perfumes, hand soaps and lotions. You can put it in your sun tea to bring a bit of, little bit of lemon flavor without necessarily having some lemons in your fridge or on your counter to do that with. You can't, even though this is a tropical plant, you can grow it in a pot and bring it inside for the winter. I do this every year. And you can almost treat this plant as sort of a bonsai where you trim it back when you bring it in in the fall so that it's not leggy and, and lacking the sunlight that it's not gonna have indoors. And it can take kind of a interesting form as you uh, trim that back year after year and bring it inside. Uh, it can also be used to infuse alcoholic beverages. Uh, and I can tell you from experience that a little goes a long way. Uh, this much foliage that you see in the picture in a mason jar of vodka is going to deliver a vodka that tastes more like lemon pledge than anything else. Something that you would clean the bathroom with maybe not so much sip on a hot day. So go easy on how much foliage you put into your tea or your vodka or what, whatever the case may be. What I had to do in this case, of course, is get more vodka and dilute it down further before I could get a lemon flavor that was a little bit less um, punch you in the face. <laughs> um, mountain mint, getting back to natives. Mountain mint is native to the Midwest and one that I really love because many people have had the experience of going to a garden center, a nursery, and buying a, a, a mint of one variety or another planting it in their landscape and finding that it is everywhere in the course of a couple growing seasons. That is not the case with mountain mint. This is a perennial plant that is not an aggressive self seeder, but it will come back year after year from its own root system. As you can see in the picture in the bottom right, I was able to integrate it into a landscape where it was perfectly happy to be right up against hot um, flagstone and just uh, doing exactly what it was supposed to, filling little cracks and tight spaces where other plants might struggle in the landscape. You can use mountain mint just like other mints. It does have the same sort of oils and, and flavor that we're looking for in mints that are traditionally sold. And what I will do oftentimes with mountain mint is I'll pull the foliage off the stem, chop it up a little finer, mix it with a fruit salad, and some honey and lime juice. And it just brings a wonderful component to a fruit salad. Borage is an annual self-seeder. This is another one that you might be smart to be cautious with. It can start to move around in the landscape, uh, but not something that's a problem if you're willing to just uh, pull it out of the ground wherever you see it growing in a place that you don't want it. As you see in the photo, it has these beautiful flowers. If you watch any sort of fancy cooking shows, lots of high-end restaurants use borage flowers to decorate their food. It does have these small hairs all over them that are not by any means thorny 
uh, but they can be a little bit, uh, when they get larger in size, those, uh, those hairs get a little, I struggle to kind of describe it, but some people just don't like the feel of it on their skin when it gets larger. But when this plant is still juvenile stage and those hairs aren't really abundant yet, the flowers and the foliage both have a wonderful cucumber flavor to them. I can pull these and eat them right in the garden fresh or um, chop them into a salad and use them that way. And it's one of the few plants that you can get in the landscape that brings both um, pink and blue flowers on the same plant. Uh, there are only a handful of plants in nature that we're aware of that have flowers that go um, that vary from pink and blue on the same plant. So if that those are colors that you're trying to integrate into uh, a, a flower border, uh, this is a great one to try. Tulsi is the um, name of a variety of basil that is very important to Hindu cultures, uh, part, many parts of India. Although it is a basil, it has a fruity note to it alongside that basil flavor that we're probably all easily able to conjure in our mind and picture what basil tastes like. So if you want to make a pesto or an herbal tea, I love using Tulsi for, for an herbal tea. You can find it sold in, in grocery stores, health food stores uh, under that name Tulsi. Just know that it is basically a basil and it's a wonderful plant to work into your landscape. This is one that does easily grow from seed. You can collect the seed off the tops that you see in the photo there, sow it in flats for the next year. And what I will do is transfer these out into the landscape in small plugs and I'll space them pretty close together so that I end up almost with this kind of 18 to 24 inch ground cover rather than planting individual plants um, with lots of space around them. It has cute little flowers that you can see here with uh, purple and pink tones. And then the, uh, the, the anthers coming out of the center of the, of the flowers with a little bit of orange color as well. This is another one that you're just gonna wanna brush past every time you walk by it and, and smell that wonderful fragrance that the foliage offers. And as I mentioned briefly, this is a, a very important, uh, it has, this plant has a lot of religious and cultural importance uh, in, in the area in and around uh, the country of India. A lot of talk about pollinators these days. If you're following this series, you've probably heard some other presenters talk about pollinators and how important that is. I'm probably preaching to the choir, so I won't go into a lot of depth on pollinators, but I just wanted to give an example of a, a border that I planted in a, in a house that I lived in previously and, and what some of those plants are. Uh, Wichita Mountains Goldenrod is uh, a beautiful one that is, you know, as, as we know, Goldenrod is the state flower in Nebraska. Wichita Mountains is a double flowering variety that uh, has uh, tighter flowers with more petals on them, uh, but the same yellow color that we expect out of Goldenrod. Canna lilies are, are a nice annual that you, uh, you know, of course, store the, the rhizomes of inside and uh, bring back out into the landscape. They provide a uh, large size for the border, uh, contrasting red flowers in this case, and really kind of a, a really bold texture to the foliage. Heliopsis in the foreground on the right is another one with sort of a daisy slash sunflower uh, arrangement to its flowers with yellow being the predominant color there. Mexican hat is another um, prairie native that's a good one to add. You can find selections of this in the nurseries that uh, are selected for flowers of different colors from a kind of a brick red all the way through to yellow also. And then wild senna is a, a favorite of mine. This is a plant that's a prairie native here in, in the Great Plains. It has this beautiful foliage that has more of a blue green color that contrasts nicely with the texture and the darker green color of everything else going on right here. And another one that's really important for pollinators, a plant that they have relied on in this part of the country for a long time. And there's the really beautiful kind of popcorn yellow uh, flowers of that wild senna. 
and the foliage of it. I just think it's so attractive. Um, so quickly, I will say there's, there's a lot, you can't throw a rock on Pinterest without uh, hitting a project where you're creating bee hotels. The one cautionary note I'll have about these from the, for the sake of the pollinators that you're trying to attract is be sure and put a nice large hat on, on these sort of projects that will keep rain off of them. When, once these uh, wood blocks start to take on water after a period of time and get moldy, that's really detrimental to the pollinators that are going to be attracted to laying their larvae inside of these holes. A uh, little silver lining, this, this is um, Phragmites. It's a invasive plant to wetlands and a real problem in some areas. And the one silver lining I'll, I'll give you as far as pollinators go is that the, the dried stems are actually the perfect uh, diameter for a lot of our pollinators. So rather than the wood blocks and different approaches to attracting them, what you can do is bundle a small um, group of those stems together and just hang them from trees and bees will take advantage of these just as easily as they would the block of wood that you might have put it down instead. So I, I guess that that last slide was a little out of order. This is seven sunflower uh, for the common name, Heptacodium myconoides. This is an Asian tree that I consider to be sort of a Midwestern crepe myrtle. If any of you are from the South or have visited the South and seen crepe myrtle and its use in the landscape down there, this is a, a great alternative to that in a part of the country where we are, where crepe myrtle is just not gonna fly from one year to the next. It's not gonna like our winters. This tree has so much ornamental value as well as value to pollinators as you saw in this picture here. So. Seven sunflower blooms in the fall when lots of other the fireworks of, of trees and shrubs blooming have finished. It's, they come on white and then the, um, the sepals that come behind the flowers are a whole second round of blooms basically. And then the nice peely bark that you see to it as well as very unique leaves. So even though I, I wanna talk about taste and smell and touch a lot, there are some plants that we really should be planting more of for those ornamental characteristics that we desire. And a plant like this gets us a real boom of color at a time of year when not a lot else is going on. This is a smaller tree, maybe 20 foot, uh, 25 foot at max. I think the nursery industry is selling single stemmed versions of it, but it tends to want to be more of a large bush. Um, at the previous house that you've seen some other pictures of before, I gave a try to chocolate vine, Akebia quinata. This is another Asian plant that I uh, kind of tucked into a flagstone uh, patio that I was installing at the base of a, um, a laundry pole that we were going to leave in place for the project. And this, this chocolate vine filled that space very quickly and efficiently. I had uh, Christmas lights strung from one laundry pole to the next, and that gave the, the vine even more space to grow on. Uh, <laughs> I, I just uh, joke in this picture on the right of, of how aggressive of a grower it is. This is not a plant that's gonna be a problem as long as it is physically restricted uh, to the space that you want it to grow on. It's not one that, that drops seed everywhere and pops up in other areas, but it will aggressively fill a trellis, a fence, or any sort of hardscape like that that you want it to be on top of. Now, why did I plant this plant? Well, I, I, I just love the kind of purple, kind of chocolate milk color flowers to, these, um, to this vine. It twirls around itself when it's starting to be limited in space. And it just looks so attractive. Uh, in and amongst those, those, uh, those holiday lights when I had them on in the evening. But what I didn't know at the time was that I was actually planting an edible landscape plant. Chocolate vine actually has a delicious edible fruit that, that is born on it unpredictably. And when I say unpredictably, that is not only here, 
but also in Japan and parts of uh, Western Asia where it is native. Um, so it, it's not easy to, to, to have a uh, commercial trade around this fruit. It's one that you're really only going to be able to, to enjoy if you go plant this in your own yard and cross your fingers year to year that you might be blessed with some of these fruit. So what you get from these fruit, it starts as a chartreuse green. The outside sort of fades to a beautiful purple color. This has obviously uh, had a filter applied to it. But on the inside, you get this sort of translucent kiwi looking flesh that has a watermelon flavor to it. And the Asian cultures that grow this plant more abundantly will also chop up the outside of the fruit and you put it in stir fries the way you might lots of other vegetables like a, a bell pepper, for example. It's often uh, thrown into smoothies and things like that where that watermelon-ish flavor can accompany other ingredients. Service berry, this, this plant is really starting to come into its own and gain some popularity uh, in the nursery trade, but we still need to see more of it planted in the landscape. It has beautiful, smooth gray bark. It has white flowers in the springtime that are attractive. It has beautiful fall color that we'll see. And it also has edible fruits on them that you really got to race the birds for, but are just delicious. They have, in my opinion, kind of an apple flavor to them, but it's kind of hard to describe the flavor itself. You can eat these right off the bush and they're perfectly delicious on their own. You can get tree small tree forms that are kind of a small ornamental tree, maybe 10 to 15 foot tall. There are also other species that are more of a, a large or small shrub. Um, this is one of the berries that was dried by indigenous people and incorporated into uh, pemmican, which is sort of a, a sweet um, jerky sort of uh, pres preserved food. As it says here, it's also, also good in pies, jams, muffins, all that sort of stuff that you would use many other berries for. You can certainly use service berry as well. Jewel Sandoz mentioned uh, June berries, which that common name refers to the time of year that the fruit comes on the plant. June berries are the berry for the Northwest. No farmer ought to fail to plant a patch. I've just distributed free wagon loads of plants from my early plantings, which were among many, among my plums and in the way. So here's uh, June berry and rhubarb in a pie. Uh, it does have these small stems on the berries that you'll need to pick off as you're cleaning that fruit for use. Uh, Graham? Yes. Uh, we had a question about the chocolate vine. Um, they wanted to know if it's very invasive and if the seeds spread easily as well. No, as I mentioned, uh, you'll be lucky to even get seeds because it fruits so unreliably. So um, if you have chocolate vine that is bearing fruit and that fruit gets a chance to fall to the ground and germinate, then you've done something wrong and you should be eating that instead. Um, but as long as you restrict the space that it's growing in, it's really gonna grow on whatever sort of support structure that you provide for it. Well, great, thank you so much. You bet. And uh, Bluebird Nursery I know sells chocolate vine. I'm sure that they, um, they retail those through your other garden centers, your mole halls and places like that. So go ask, ask around for it and it shouldn't be all that difficult to, to find one to try in your landscape. Uh, persimmon is one of those trees that we often associate with the South, but is perfectly at home here in Eastern Nebraska and a great tree to grow. It has um, flowers that are pretty inconspicuous. You're not gonna plant it for that ornamental attribute necessarily. Uh, but the persimmon leaves have been used to make tea. Uh, Diaspiros is the genus name for the tree, and that translates from Greek to divine fruit or fruit of the gods. It has one of the highest sugar contents of any fruit in the world, which is quite, um, quite a claim to make of something that grows here in the Midwest. Uh, the wood has traditionally been used for golf clubs before we turned to uh, alloy metals for that purpose, billiard cues as well. So the, the wood 
has a lot of nice attributes for, for woodworking. The bark has a really neat kind of alligator skin texture to it that kind of shows this orange out from between the ridges, similar to the way mulberry does. On the left-hand side is an example of a specimen tree down at uh, Arbor Lodge in Nebraska City, kind of showing you the dimensions that this tree can accomplish. There are a number of them on 40th and coming um, on the northeast corner of the, there, there's, a, there's a large estate. I'm um, blanking on the name of the people that own that, that uh, property, but they have a number of, of large American persimmon growing there. The problem with persimmon is that it's another one of these that's hard to ever find in the grocery store because if we look at the picture on the left, that looks really tasty and it's not tasty at all. It's not until the fruit has fallen off the tree to the ground and almost started to look like it's rotting that the sugars really develop in it. And so by the time it's attractive to your palate, it's no longer attractive to the eye. And so it's really difficult to um, get a market going for a plant that has those attributes. But you can take this, uh, you, you can eat them just fresh how they are. And they're very sweet when they're in this stage on the right hand side, or you can run them through a macerator and use them to the same way you might for overripe bananas in breads and puddings, things of that nature. So there's an example of persimmon uh, put into a bread pudding. Pecan, this is another one of those trees that we associate with the South, but we can grow it here very well. And even up in South Sioux City in the Northeastern part of the state, they can get away with growing pecan, although the growing season is too short to expect any sort of a nut crop out of it that far North. But around here, we sure still can grow them uh, for their nuts, as well as, as, a, as a really attractive shade tree. The Nebraska Nut Growers Association, you can turn to them for some feedback on selections that have been picked for Nebraska if, you're, if harvesting nuts from them is really your goal. One thing that's worth mentioning is that, uh, as you can see in this picture on the bottom right, around the outside of the nut itself is a green husk that you can see there. And when those fall off of the nut to the ground and dry, you can use those husks for smoking meat the same, the same way that you would use pecan wood itself. So it's a more sustainable source of um, smoking material for your ribs or uh, chicken, anything like that. Usually what I'll do with the husks is soak them in water overnight the day before I use them but they can go right on the charcoals uh, dry as they are. And this is our state champion pecan in a yard in uh, Dundee. And here's another one on East Campus in Lincoln, kind of showing you how this tree really comes into its own as a large shade tree that provides so many benefits from habitat value, food for us and wildlife, uh, shade on our buildings, carbon sequestration, uh, stormwater capture, a lot of wonderful things that we can do with a tree like pecan. While we're talking about nut trees, let's talk about some of the hickories, which are also plants that we shy away from planting on our streets uh, for an irrational fear that we're gonna have nuts falling from the sky, raining down and and causing dents in our, in our cars as if there was a hailstorm. When in reality, these nuts are so uh, desirable to all the small mammals in your neighborhood that most of them will not fall to the ground whole. You might have pieces of those husks falling off, but they will relish those nuts if they're being produced by the tree and uh, be much less of a problem than most people expect. So as it says, Nebraska has two native hickory species, bitternut and shagbark. As the name implies, bitternut is gonna have, um, you know, nut meats that are um, less desirable than shagbark, uh, but they're both worth trying, uh, baked into pies, um, that sort of thing. So this shows you the native range 
of Caria laciniosa, uh, not quite into Nebraska, but just because it's not natively found here doesn't mean we can't grow it well in at least the uh, southeast and uh, up through here in Douglas County. A lot of people just sort of discount yellow fall color. And I think that's one thing worth mentioning really fast. Everybody oohs and ahs over trees that show reds and oranges in the fall. But these, these buttery yellow colors that some trees provide in the fall, I think are equally spectacular. And in some cases, even more uh, of a standout when you have lots of other trees and a really dark uh, space with lots of uh, trees together for that yellow to really pop amongst the other trees that you have in your landscape. Another native uh, woody that we uh, should be planting more of is clove currant. You might be familiar with some of the other currants that are uh, more commonly used. Uh, clove currant is a Great Plains native that as the uh, species name implies odoratum, uh, it has a real fragrant kind of spicy smell uh, to, the, to the, uh, the flowers when they're born. Also pretty attractive fall color when it gets the chance to, to sort of gracefully move into fall and not get cold really fast like we do have sometimes happen here. Uh, it's, it's, I put it right in there in that category with service berry. It's got edible fruit, beautiful fall color, a lot of attractive attributes that make it worth integrating into your landscape. And the largest berries of all the currants that uh, we can grow in this area. So there's what those look like. Again, a small little stock to uh, pick off. Uh, sometimes if I'm gonna sit in front of the TV for a little while, I'll, uh, I'll have my bowl of these and I can basically pick these without looking at, at them and uh, get something useful accomplished while I'm sitting on the couch. Uh, and then hazels and filberts. Uh, we're all familiar with hazelnuts. This is an American uh, species of shrub that we can grow here. It's kind of large for smaller residential spaces. It can get 12 to 15 feet tall in some cases, uh, but just a wonderful uh, nut to uh, be able to, to get out of your landscape if you have the space for it. Uh, my dad used to make me a Belgian birthday cake, which was a chocolate cake with ganache over the top and then hazelnuts rolled in, in cocoa powder. It's just absolutely amazing. Uh, but there is also a tree form. This is a European species uh, called uh, Turkish filbert. Um, it's, it's a little marginally hardy, so don't go planting a ton of them or, or expecting 100% success with it. It's not gonna like some of our colder winters that it'll see, uh, but it is a very handsome uh, street tree uh, when it can be pulled off and grown successfully. And the last uh, shrub I believe that I talk about here uh, that produces berries is aronia. You're not necessarily gonna eat these right off the bush. They have a very astringent flavor that they have a lot of tannins that give red wine that dry mouth feel, but it's a beautiful plant with, with stunning fall color to it. White flowers in the spring, sort of like service berry does. And what I'll usually do is pick these, put them in the freezer till I'm ready to use them, throw them into pancakes where I'm gonna have uh, some syrup uh, mixed in with that that sort of offsets the real astringent uh, tangy uh, flavor of the berries themselves. Iowa is the largest commercial producer of aronia in the country. It's being touted for its antioxidant uh, properties. It has a lot of those in there for folks that are looking for that in their diet. And then pawpaw, even though it looks like a real tropical plant with fruit that looks sort of like that chocolate vine, it is native to the uh, Appalachia region and up uh, kind of just flirting with Nebraska a little bit. And we can successfully grow it as well as the fruits that it bears. Um, this is our current state champion, Pawpaw, uh, just south of Nebraska City on a trailhead. It, uh, this is a plant that sort of suckers and forms a clonal thicket sort of like I mentioned about American plum. So not one to plant where you just want a single tree to not be popping up out of the ground in other places over time. The fruit has been uh, attributed to tasting kind of like a mixture of pineapple, mango. It has a really tropical flavor 
that's hard to put your finger on and describe accurately. So now I'll get into just some more creative uses of plants you're probably already familiar with. At my previous home, we had a deck that was along a busy street. We put some privacy panels up, but we could only put those up so high without getting uh, you know, outside of the municipal code uh, on the rules for that height. So with an apple tree, we can grow what's called a spalier, where we're pruning the, the tree into a wall, basically. So I did go ahead and, and plant a, an apple tree in between the deck and the privacy panels, and then proceeded to, to prune those branches laterally so that I could have apples that were right at the deck level. And as the tree got taller over time, give some additional screening quality to it. I wasn't in this house long enough to really see this espalier through to its uh, a, a good example to share with you, but I was getting apples on it readily. Uh, there's a crab apple in the background there that was a perfectly good pollinator for this tree. Uh, a lot of people love purple plants and they provide really nice contrast in the landscape. And so these are a couple I'm gonna share with you. I'm gonna be mindful of time though, because we really are uh, getting close to the bottom of the hour and I've got a lot more to share with you. So a lot of people like the Japanese maples on the top left and a, an alternative to that, if you don't have a space with the right microclimate for it is this new selection of elderberry that has purple foliage to it that might be something that's much more hardy for you that you could try. On the bottom left is Sistina plum. A lot of you are familiar with that plant. In the middle, uh, Crimson King, Norway maple, and then smoke bush over here. These are all some popular purple leaf plants that this new selection of elderberry might fit the bill for you in ways that these others might be too big or uh, just not fitting the, the space that you have it for, have for it. Uh, some annuals that you could consider are castor bean and some selections of amaranth. Now, castor bean is of course the opposite of edible. This is not a plant that you want to have in your landscape if you're worried about uh, little people or uh, animals eating the seeds. Uh, it does have a uh, poison uh, in those seeds, so use that plant with caution, but very bold purple foliage that you can incorporate into the landscape. Amaranth, on the other hand, is a cereal grain crop that, ha that has uh, purple leaf selections of that you can work into your landscape for not only beauty, uh, but also potentially to harvest uh, the small little seeds from. Everybody's familiar with squash and pumpkins. Uh, I don't need to mention why they're cool or why you might want to plant them in your landscape. Um, but the, the squash blossoms are something that not everybody is aware of. They're great to eat. Stuff those with ricotta cheese and herbs, roll them in some egg and, and flour and fry them and they're just they just scream late spring to you as you eat it. It's delicious. Uh, but you can also grow these up on structures if you want to make it easier to harvest your, your gourds from. Pick a variety that has smaller fruits that aren't going to weigh down the structure or fall off the plant before they're fully formed. But what a fun way to sort of see all the fruits of your labor under a um, trellis, if you will. Uh, these snake gourds are not really edible, but they're great for arts and crafts. Uh, some people will dry them and paint them. And then, of course, your, your loofah gourds can be dried and used for loofah scrub sponges that we're probably all familiar with using uh, to get clean in the shower and the bath. Uh, some people are making these fiberglass melon forms where you can, uh, once the fruit starts to form, put it inside the top of this form and then it will produce a different size and shape. Well, not really a different size, but at least a unique shape to the melons that in some cases make them more stackable and easy to transport or just give you fun shapes like these Mickey Mouse melons that you see on the bottom right. Fresh cut flowers. Whenever you're growing plants that have flowers that you like, it's always good to bring at least some of those inside to appreciate when you're not in the yard all the time. While there is a whole uh, discipline around arranging cut flowers in a, in a pleasing way, I'll tell you that anybody can do it. If you go 
cut uh, cut down what you have growing in the yard and put it in a vase of some sort, it'll look attractive. And you can incorporate some garlic scapes and things like that in that maybe aren't necessarily flowers, but provide a unique uh, shape and texture and color to the other flowers that you do have. And then it's worth mentioning moon gardens. This is kind of a cool concept not everybody's aware of. There are plants out there that you can research that open their flowers in the evening time instead of during the day. And if you like to entertain company in the evening time outside, this can be a neat thing to try to pull off in a uh, part of your garden where maybe you sit and enjoy the evening garden. Cold, cold frames are a great addition to your landscape. Uh, they can extend the growing season for the crops that you grow. They don't necessarily have to be fancy uh, aluminum and, and uh, fiberglass and plastic structures. You can just use old windows and, and straw bales in order to uh, protect your annual crops from uh, fluctuations in cold fluctuations in temperature in the spring, or if you want to extend the season into the fall a little bit. And of course, dead stuff. We need to make better use of the things in our landscape that have died already. In permaculture, we like to talk about closing waste loops and keeping everything on site as much as we can. Pallets like, the, like we see in the top left are a really great way to plant row crops and sort of keep weeds down in between your rows of beets, carrots, anything that will actually fit um, when it's time to pull it out from between those pallets. Um, logs can be cut up and used as a border for uh, your garden beds. Bugle culture is a uh, Austrian term for incorporating your dead matter into the landscape in a way that wicks moisture into a, a raised berm. So you plant your crops into this berm that has incorporated uh, rotten wood, sticks, grass clippings, and that, that rotten material will actually pull water out of the ground and wick it up into uh, the rest of the, the pile that's higher up above the ground where you don't have to bend over to cultivate it as much. And you can uh, more effectively control how much moisture these plants have if they're sensitive to being in, in a, a wet situation for long periods of time. So here's an example of how I did that in my landscape. I found a spot uh, maybe mid-range on, on a hillside where water was going to drain towards. I chopped up some, some logs that were already starting to rot and put those down in the, uh, the hole that I dug, put some uh, twigs and uh, sod on top of that. And then I have sort of a, a pile that I can put some, some, uh, some edible crops if you want to do annuals, um, carrots, tomatoes, things like that. And, and water's going to drain towards this and then be made available to that mound through that rotting material. If you got a tree that's dying or is going to be cut down for some reason, you don't have to cut it all the way at the ground level. Leave that stump high up and either have a go at chainsaw carving yourself if you feel comfortable with using a chainsaw safely, or hire somebody that can come in and uh, create an attractive sculpture for you out of your tree that's no longer part of your landscape. Uh, I would consider this to be more of a, a tree taxidermy. Uh, this was a, a landscape I drove past and just snapped some photos where they had an old uh, juniper, I think it was, a, a huge uh, juniper shrub that they uh, cut down and then meticulously uh, uh, applied shellac uh, to the root system and kind of expose that to show the, the natural beauty of that root system below ground and then had a, a small planter within the stump that they could put annual flowers in. Then finally, grass clippings. Grass clippings are great for your backyard chickens to peck through for insects and seeds. Uh, they're also great mulch around your uh, annual crops as well. And then finally, I'll leave you with you know, be sure not to cut all those large, large low branches off of your trees so that our young ones uh, have access to climbing trees. We, we are always thinking about safety in our landscapes, which is a good thing, but we also need to provide kids the ability to uh, interact with nature 
and uh, just sit in a tree for a little while and enjoy the backyard. So with that, there's some contact information for me. There's a small plug for my nonprofit, Omaha Permaculture. You could learn more about on Facebook or our website. And um, with that, I'll take any other questions we have with the few minutes that are left. Yeah, if anybody has any last minute questions, you can put them in the chat now. Also, that same poll from the beginning is going to pop up on your screen in a second, and we would really appreciate you filling that out. Um, there was one question that we had in the chat from Marlene. Um, it says, what variety of the elderberry is purple? Uh, yeah, I, I should know that. Um, I'm sure that when you go to your garden center, you're going to find that out. Uh, but I don't recall the name of the cultivar off the top of my head. But if you find elderberry, elderberry being sold in your nursery, it's probably that purple leaf variety because it's a plant that most people are not interested in incorporating just the straight species of uh, into their landscape. But I don't remember the name of that cultivar that's purple. Should be pretty easy to find online, though. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, maybe black lace, someone commented in the chat. That um, sounds right. Yes, very good. All right, and then we had an anonymous question that says, what are your top three easy to care for trees for a yard? Uh, easy to care for, you know, I think most trees are pretty easy to take care of. Uh, when, when trees are not easy to take care of, it's usually because we fuss over the lawn too much. Um, if, if, uh, if your grass is getting excessively fertilized and having lots of applications to it, then most likely that's part of why your tree might be struggling. Uh, for, you know, I'm always thinking about diversity. You're asking a forester. So this is a whole other conversation to have that's not easily answered quickly. Um, easy to care for trees. Um, I, I, again, they're all pretty easy. It comes down to the size that you want it to stop at. Uh, thinking about any sort of conflicts it might have with your home or the power lines, that's always an important consideration. Uh, but any anytime you have a, a, a tree like some of the ones I mentioned, persimmon, pawpaw, uh, pecan, all, the, all three of those that start with P, um, those have various mature sizes that are not only wonderful as trees, as shade plants, uh, but also have that, that edible component and an attractive plant that provides diversity we don't want to be planting a whole lot of the same thing and putting too many eggs in one basket all right and then we have another question from tracy in the chat um they want to know what is your definition of permaculture again that's a whole other other presentation that i could spend an hour or two on uh permaculture is a multidisciplinary approach to uh living in harmony with people and the land um, it is a, a way that we care for the earth and we care for ourselves and the uh, surplus we, we give back to the community. So in permaculture, we're conserving uh, energy. We're conserving, um, you know, using everything on the landscape as best we can, uh, stacking functions and um, really living in as, as close to harmony as we can. Um, but it sure does, it's very multi, multidisciplinary and uh, bleeds out into lots of other disciplines as well. You could look for uh, books by um, uh, Dave Mollison. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a, coin, a term that was coined in the late 70s, but uh, there's, there's a, a lot of good books on permaculture as well as websites. And then we have another anonymous question. It says, do you have any suggestions for planning landscapes? It seems a little overwhelming to start designing my yard. Yeah, it is. And, and uh, mature size is really important. I think one mistake that lots of people make when they're planning their, their landscapes is they either, um, they, they don't account for the mature size of a plant or they rely too heavily on on selections that get really large. So uh, the two mistakes that I see made a lot are either um, not accounting for how large a plant's gonna be or being scared of how big they're gonna be and planting individuals instead of plant communities. 
when we look in nature, there are no plants that are just growing all by themselves with nothing else around it. In most cases, uh, plants like to exist in close proximity to other plants. And so uh, rather than having plants that are all individuals with seas of mulch or river rock around them, try to plant uh, things in drifts and communities uh, and mimic nature as best you can. All right, it seems like that is all of the questions for now. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Graham, for all of the wonderful information about how we can use plants in a functional way. Because I mean, there was another comment about how like borage is a great plant for pollinators and about how yeah. bees love borage. And I just wanted to say that that's what I really loved about this webinar because I feel like aesthetics can play an important role for some people, but it's just nice to have like more information on an alternative way to look at gardening, like in a way that just like not only benefits us, but like everything around us. And I just think that it's really cool. And I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us about this. Yeah, we don't have to throw out beauty in order to get function in the landscape. Sometimes it takes thinking about beauty a little bit differently and getting out of that Disneyland tightly clipped and manicured mindset and letting things be a little fuzzier, a little more, um, packed together in the, in the landscape as, as groups and communities. Uh, I wanna thank you guys for having me uh, give this presentation. There are a lot of great questions and I know that I didn't answer them uh, anywhere near adequately, that they were very insightful questions that deserve a much longer answer with some more time down the road. Yeah, and um, for anyone watching, uh, hopefully tomorrow I'll send out a follow-up email. So if you have any questions afterwards, you can just respond to that email that I send out. Yeah. And yeah, if there's no more questions, that's it. Make sure to check out our Facebook page for more upcoming events. And we hope to see you all at another event in the future. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, everybody.